Good evening everyone. Welcome to the Council Briefing. I declare the meeting open at two minutes past six and I'd like to start by acknowledging that tonight we meet on the lands of the Wadjuk people of the Noongar Nation and pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, we do have apologies from Councillor Rosalind Harley this evening and um, we are expecting Councillor Jimmy Murphy. So we will go straight to public question time and receiving of public statements. So welcome members of the public gallery. I note that Chris is keen to go first. Um, but before you do, if I could just state that when you do come up to the microphone, we do just ask that you state your name, the suburb in which you live and the item that you're speaking to this evening. There isn't a set order, but um, I will invite Chris forward given that he's indicated he'd like to speak. Thank you. Okay, I'll now go to the CEO for any declarations of interest. None? No, we have none received this evening. Okay, so just to explain, this is the council briefing, which is an opportunity for council members to ask questions of administration to seek further information on the reports that have been provided. Um, the way in which um, I will go through the items is the order in which they have been raised by members of the public first. So um, that being 5.1, 5.2, 5.5, 5.3, 5.4, and then we will go through um, the remainder of the agenda in sequence. So, um, council members, we're starting with item 5.1, which is 51 Albert Street, North Perth, proposed alterations and additions to the club premises and change of use from club premises to club premises and childcare premises and licence for use of car park at number 160 Albert Street, North Perth. Questions, please, council members. Councillor Hallett. Thank you through the Mayor to the um, Director or possibly one of the managers. Um, just in the report there was a statement that the Macedonian Club had previously paid for 21 bays to be installed adjacent to the subject site. Um, can you just confirm that that means that they've paid for the civil works as opposed to um, general payments for the bays? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, would you be able to just repeat the last part of that question? Did they fund the civil works or, or was that the full question? Sorry. Pretty much the full question, yeah. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, I believe they made a contribution towards the construction of those bays, but we can confirm in the briefing notes if that um, covered the entire works or was just a component. Councillor Hallett, are you inquiring as to whether that then leads the club to have express rights to park in those bays? Or Possibly. No? Okay. I think, I mean, that was my interpretation of your question that you were asking that it was simply paying for the bays which are still remain public bays. Could you please confirm that, Coordinator? Through you, Mayor Cole. So I believe they made a contribution towards construction of 21 bays, but those were public bays and not for the exclusive use of the club, um, just provided to facilitate the club there and the church across the road, but they remain open to the public. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Fatakis. Uh, through you, Mayor, to um, the director or one of the managers. Um, Will the community centre's uh, liquor licence uh, remain um, in place? Um, and I've got a further qu qu question that might be relevant after that. Through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, I believe the liquor licence would remain in place, but they would probably need to amend the licence area to exclude the ground floor. Uh, from the city's point of view, we just provide a certificate of land use approval to liquor licensing, and then they um, limit the areas that are licensed. Um, I'm just um, interested to know, um, I suppose, how much um, we really have to pay heed to uh, the national regulations. Um, 
and there are restrictions uh, requiring children to be in an environment that is free from the use of tobacco, illicit drugs and tobacco, and that sort of drew my interest that, that within the one building. So um, really when we're making these, these decisions, and we do have some national regulations as to how much of a guidance that they play in this, knowing that there um, is, uh, um, we're moving a childcare centre into essentially what is a, a licensed premises. through you, Mayor Cole, that would be covered by a separate legislation that the Planning and Development Act doesn't regulate, so it would be separate to the planning approval process. They'd still need to comply with liquor licensing requirements and any of the requirements for um, childcare premises that is separately regulated. Um, I suppose, sorry, but my understanding is that are we in a position to be able to approve um, a childcare service knowing, uh, knowingly going into a licensed premises. So wh where does that sit with us? Through you, Mayor Cole. So from the city's point of view, as mentioned earlier, for liquor licensing, we only provide land use approval details to liquor licensing and they will regulate the areas that are licensed and whether or not those areas are operating in accordance with those approvals. Um, we can include an advice note that, um, that requires them to contact liquor licensing and consider any of those requirements that might apply under their current licensing. And similarly with regards to um, the Tobacco Products Control Amendment Bill um, from 2017 um, with regards to, um, um, I think uh, what I'm looking at is um, ensuring that there aren't any, if they're having functions uh, during the daytime, that um, any areas where people might be smoking is, uh, is not, um, there's no direct contact or there are sort of almost what we regard as buffer zones through you, Mayor Cole. Uh, so there is still an obligation for them to comply with all of those other separate le legislations that can't be restricted through the planning approval process. The applicant has indicated that in general, functions wouldn't occur on the first floor at the same time that the childcare centre is operating, um, that, that, u that is those uses on the first floor predominantly operate outside of the childcare centre hours and that it might just be educational purposes up there as opposed to functions which would generally occur in the evenings. Uh, just one last one. Uh, we have to get an indication of other childcare centres that have been approved that operate outside our 7am to 7pm um, hours so others, other childcare centres will have approved um, operation outside those hours. Through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide that in the briefing notes. Councillors, any questions? Um, coordinator, I had some questions in relation to the parking. The report talks about the fact that um, there has been an offer from the church to provide 14 bays for reciprocal parking, but um, that was deemed to not be appropriate given the use of those bays for. Um, uh, for functions and um, services at the church during the week. But I did wonder whether um, allocation of bays, uh, a smaller number of bays may be appropriate for staff um, or potentially to be allocated during peak pick-up and drop-off period from those 14 bays that have been offered on a reciprocal basis. Through you, Mayor Cole, that's certainly open to it. I think um, from the city's point of view, when undertaking the assessment and considering the key times that the church would operate, that there may potentially be some conflict with the childcare centre and that the 14 bays that are on site would be needed for services that may occur <laughs> during the day. And we wouldn't want to take up those five bays with staff um, that would be there during those key times for the church. Um, it's certainly available to consider um, requiring them on that site. However, we believe that the city's car park, which is directly south of the site, would be more appropriately located given the parking surveys that have been done in that area that shows that there's quite a high vacancy rate during the key um, pick up and drop off and staff times that would be needed for that. Okay, well, it's just, I think the point in the report sort of talked about the fact that many funerals and services happen from around 11am 
and that there may be an opportunity for that to be more compatible with pick up and drop off and just wondering if there'd be any willingness to look at that again in relation to some allocation for pick up and drop off points. And the other question in relation to parking was I note that the lease bays are allocated in the, um, in the main car park area, but I wondered whether consideration had been given to allocating those bays on Macedonia Place, which would then be close to the um, foyer entrance and potentially um, be much easier, more easy to differentiate um, from the main car park. through you, Mayor Cole. So in relation to the first point about the um, pick up and drop off bays on the church site, probably the only concern would be it, certainly that, that those bays would be available for pick up and drop off and I'm sure um, that the club would make them accessible during those times, only just that they are across the road and there are a number of bays on the same side of the road that could be accessible for pick up and drop off. In relation to the use of the bays on Macedonia Place versus the ones in the southern car park, um, that was something our engineering team had identified those five bays as being suitably appropriate because there is a um, pedestrian entrance to the facility from the southern side that provides at-grade access. Um, but we can investigate whether Macedonia Place would be more appropriate. Thank you. And just one of the other variations it talks about in the report is shaded play space. Has there um, been a look at whether the addition of a further tree, that given that there is excess um, than that required for the overall play space, um, was any consideration given by the applicant or by the city to look at potentially an additional tree canopy or something to provide that shaded play space to meet the um, recommended amount? Through you, Mayor Cole, I think uh, from the city's point of view, we considered that there was quite a sufficient number of trees on site in addition to those that surround the site on the POS and in the car park that would provide shading. I think the, con the technical assessment shows that there's not sufficient on site, but we believe that there is sufficient surrounding that would provide additional shade into the site and, and wouldn't require an additional tree or, or um, shade structure. Thank you. And um, whilst not technically planning considerations, if the applicant would be um, happy to provide the information, I would be interested to know whether an um, operator has been appointed and whether the um, childcare will be open for local intake. Through you, Mayor Cole. We confirm in the briefing notes, but to date the applicants indicated that the Macedonian Club would be running the facility and would try to continue to do that um, unless it became unmanageable and then would look for an operator. And at this stage, that it would be open to the club and also the wider public. Thank you. Um, councillors, any questions? Councillor Gontoshevsky? Um, just in relation to the um, traffic assessment, um, if, uh, um, if it would be possible to either provide in the briefing notes or draw my attention to the assessment in relation to the um, impact on traffic compared to the current use, um, what the assessment of the current traffic impact would be on the local area versus um, what the potential impact would be of the additional vehicle movements to and from the site or whether there is in fact additional vehicle movements to or from the site. My, my reading of the traffic report was that it primarily related to throughput traffic on Charles rather than movement to the site, but if um, uh, some commentary would be great on that. Through you, Mayor Cole, I believe page 86 of the agenda talks about trip generation um, to the site and the resulting trips coming to and from this property from this development. And I guess I'd just be grateful to get an assessment given that the use is changing. So it's the land use issue compared to what's currently occurring as to what the, um, whether there's an estimate of what the current impacts are um, and whether this is an intensification or a, a perhaps a, a downgrading of what would be the current use on the site in relation to traffic. Through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide that in the briefing notes. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, thank you. 
We'll move to item 5.2, which is 48 and number 50, Cow Street, West Perth, multiple dwelling amendment to approved. Councillor Loden. Just wanted to clarify on the um, assessment process. Uh, it says um, that there should be at least one energy efficiency measure incorporated, um, but it does not comply with those based on the report. I was just wondering whether there was an opportunity to include any conditions around that or why there wasn't any further, anything further proposed in that space. Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. The um, the acceptable outcomes or element objective talks about there being opportunities to reduce energy consumption, um, and the acceptable outcomes suggest providing at least one significant energy efficiency initiative. Uh, and the development hasn't demonstrated either of those because they didn't provide an ESD assessment or a NatHERS rating uh, as it was before our built form policy came into effect. The, however, the um, pathway to approval and consideration under the design print or the performance based assessment allows for alternative considerations and then that takes you to different elements and in our assessment it's considered that there are aspects of the development that could provide sustainability measures. It certainly is... Hmm, it's not quite clear it through the new framework under Design WA about our ability to condition requirements given it is a performance-based assessment. So whether or not we could condition that they provide an ESD assessment that identifies sustainability measures that are required to be implemented at building permit is not quite clear. Uh, those matters would need to be addressed at the building permit stage. Um, however, if it is open to council to in the performance-based assessment conclude that it hasn't satisfied that requirement um, and then we could craft a condition that would require some development, uh, some sustainability measure to be implemented. So we can discuss that with the applicant through the briefing notes and um, provide a condition or um, some further information as to what they're intending to do. Um, I, I note in the report it does refer to the sustainability measures which talk to um, water measures and um, some canopy measures but there isn't specifically any energy measures that I could observe um, so I'd be interested to know if there were any ones that were that they they did include because the acceptable outline come refers specifically to energy there isn't it is it's unclear to me how energy efficient this development is so if that could be included, that would be great. Councillors, any questions? Um, just out of interest, coordinator, um, the, the history of this application has been dealt with by the JDAP, but this extension of time has come before council. Just wondering if there's any reason for that. Through you, Mayor Cole, under the um, Development Assessment Panel regulations, the applicant can elect to have a Form 2 extension of time considered by the local government or the JADA, and the city's current delegation indicates that where it's a significant change, um, that it would need to come to council for consideration, and in our view, because the framework has changed since the original consideration, we believe it's appropriate for consideration by council. Thank you for that clarification. Any further questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next item raised um, during public question time, which was 5.5. .5. Um, just to note, this is a very late report that has only just really been provided to council members, I think an hour before the meeting. Um, and I don't know that many council members would have had the opportunity to read it. So just sort of proceeding on that basis. Um, this report is for number nine, Baker Avenue, Perth. Proposed change of use from single house to single house and unlisted use music studio. Oh, okay. Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, just through the chair, I was just wondering um, how you arrived to the decision to limit the capacity. So I noticed that there's two for 100, two for 80, two for 60. Is there any particular reason why that is? Okay. 
Sorry, continue. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, largely, those numbers are arbitrary. Uh, I know that when uh, the application was first submitted, um, the applicant was seeking uh, approval for a maximum occupancy of 100 people. Uh, that largely aligns with capacity numbers uh, based on health legislation. Um, that's where the 100 came from. In terms of the city's consideration of the proposal and its context, um, we were of the view that that was uh, uh, the scale intensity um, was significant and uh, on that basis the suggestion was put forward from the city to reduce that scale. 6280 um, was, a, uh, was some numbers uh, put forward from the applicant saying that generally um, the occupancy would be about 60 to 80 but could reach to, a, to 100. So in terms of satisfying uh, the city in terms of reducing the scale intensity we used those arbitrary numbers of 60, 80 and 100 to, uh, to demonstrate um, uh, a reduction in that scale intensity and just to see, I guess, during this trial period that's been suggested, uh, whether the uh, proposal can work um, and operate without detrimentally impacting on the adjoining residents. Thank you. And um, just another question uh, in regards to the acoustic report, <clears throat> I'm just... Um, wondering why that has been uh, mandated as well. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, mandated in terms of a con condition of approval? Yeah, as a condition of the approval, yeah. Through you, Mayor Cole, there's a number of recommendations made in the acoustic report. Um, ultimately, uh, it's to ensure that the noise uh, regulations and those requirements can be satisfied. Um, things like make, ensuring that the doors are closed and such um, while the, the performances are occurring, uh, just to ensure that there is no detrimental impact on adjoining properties through noise. Thank you. Councillor Castle. Uh, through you, Mayor Cold. Yeah, I've just got a question or a couple of questions. Firstly, in relation to the six-month limit, I'm just wondering what, how you arrived at that um, that period of time, what um, reaction the applicant has had, and if you consider or if they consider that's sufficient time to measure the impact of the um, operations. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, again, no real science to six months, aside from the fact that um, the applicant was seeking, uh, seeking approval for uh, these events to be running for perpetuity. Um, ultimately, through the city's assessment, and I appreciate that I may not have an opportunity to read through that, uh, again, scale, intensity and frequency of these events um, became an issue. Uh, and on that basis, uh, we, in order to have a favourable recommendation, we suggested um, to time limit. That's a principle that has been applied in the past where there may be some land use conflicts. Uh, six months, again, was seen to be a time frame, a season of events, um, uh, of an event per month um, in order to demonstrate, and city's officers were of the view that that would be adequate time to demonstrate um, without uh, potentially having a time frame that was probably too long that may have detrimental impacts on adjoining properties. Six months was the number that we landed on. Um, put that forward to the applicant uh, on f this past Friday, and I guess that's probably the reason why uh, it's come to you late uh, in terms of trying to reconcile that. Uh, so the applicant has suggested that um, they would be uh, uh, agreeable to those terms. Um, however, uh, ultimately, there might be an opportunity um, to, uh, I guess, um, increase the capacity as well as um, the time frame might be for perpetuity after the six-month trial. Uh, and just a further question. It, it might be a, um, a wording issue, and having only just read this, I'm just trying to ascertain exactly what is meant by two events shall have a maximum of 100 and two eighty two sixty. Um, just trying to get the definition of performance, event and session clear in my mind. Do they, these events refer to the monthly event that may include four sessions? 
and is that how does that hundred so just trying to and perhaps it just means that um, for next week that might need to be expressed a little bit more clearly but can you explain what your intention was? Through you Mayor Cole, um, yes it took us a while to, to, to word this up as well so I appreciate that there might be some improvements and opportunities there. Ultimately it's uh, the, the purpose of condition one as well as 2.2 and 2.3 they probably all work together in that it's uh, there's a uh, an event or a, uh, ultimately a performance. Now, each performance will last for approximately three hours. Now, the applicant is seeking uh, approval for the ability to have uh, each of those performances occur on a Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday evening, and then a Sunday afternoon. So in that way, there's four p performances potentially in a weekend. That is four sessions. That's um, how the administration has described that. And ultimately each of those weekends would form an event. So therefore you would have, uh, in a six month period, six events um, over six uh, months. And uh, I guess two of those would have 100 person capacity, two of them would have an 80 person capacity and two of them would have a 60 person capacity. So does that mean, uh, for example, December could have four sessions with 100 people at each session? But then January might be 60 people at each of the four sessions in that month. Through Mayor Cole, uh, yes, that's possible. Councillor Hallett. Thank you. I'm going to revisit a couple of those. Sorry, I just wanted a bit more detail. Um, just can you just explain a little bit more about the, the 100, the 80 and the 60? Um, I understand that it's about reducing the um, impact for some, but given that it's been recommended that at least for two events, 100 is okay, why are we still looking at 80 and 60? And would there be different types of monitoring or sound testing that would be done for each of those different amounts? Through you, Mayor Cole, Again, uh, I guess in, I understand that if 100 is, I understand the logic where if 100 is acceptable, then um, why not have that as just the maximum? Uh, I'm not, of, well, I haven't got any evidence because it hasn't been tested as to whether 100 is acceptable. Again, uh, 60 and 80 are arbitrary numbers. The purpose is just, or the intent is just to reduce that scale. So not wedded to those numbers, um, but Ultimately, it would also give the city an opportunity and the applicant an opportunity to test those and see what is the, um, the capacity that is appropriate, where it can be appropriately managed. Um, in the admin's recommendations for um, the small scale operations that are outside of the dedicated events is from 7am to 7pm. Um, on the third page, it referred to um, the request from the applicant for normal business hours nine to five. So I'm just wondering um, why the difference there? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, that's simply around uh, flexibility. Um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, typically align with the noise regulations in terms of uh, permissible um, noise emissions. And uh, I guess in terms of this particular site, it was viewed to be appropriate to have those types of uses um, operating between 7 a.m. and, and 7 p.m. Um, aligning with those noise requirements, because ultimately that's what it comes down to in terms of impacts on the adjoining properties. Um, and I realise this is slightly different to um, um, our approvals for licence premises and things, but just um, for a lot of other uses we allow for later night on Sundays when there's a public holiday on Monday and just wondering whether consideration was given to that. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, you'll see in the proposal um, from the applicant that they were seeking a Sunday evening session. Um, ultimately, uh, in terms of reducing the scale intensity, uh, it was considered that from a conservative approach, a Sunday afternoon would be more appropriate. 
Um, again, that doesn't mean that we can't contemplate uh, a greater intensity at maybe a later date or um, even as part of this, but uh, officer's view was that uh, a Sunday afternoon would be appropriate. Um, and I understand that the, you've communicated with the applicant about the six-month um, time limit and that they're amenable, presumably, to that. Um, but I'm just wondering about consideration of um, this is a kind of membership-based um, events that may take some time to build up to the, the numbers um, and whether you'd consider um, longer than that, uh, 12 months, for example. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I, I guess a longer period of time would be something that could be contemplated. Uh, my only comment would be that the principle would still apply of having a time-limited approval and if it was to be extended to a year or year plus, um, ensuring that there is some uh, review mechanism built in um, to ensure that the management and operation is, um, is appropriate and it can be uh, demonstrated that it is occurring without um, like adverse impacts on the adjoining properties. Thank you, Mayor Cole. Um, as I did discuss uh, with the manager previously, so I will flag an amendment that will be uh, to extend the time period, but with the uh, review of the uh, venue management plan to occur after six months, um, because that, that's the critical element to be reviewed. Um, uh, the six months, I won't explain why, but I, well, I'll actually ask as a question. Uh, <laughs> if, you have an, if you have a development approval for six months and we were to meet our 90-day statutory time frames, at what point would somebody need to actually submit an application for review of the decision, uh, allowing, assuming that this was enacted the day after approval was given and allowing for Christmas, etc. Et Reasonably speaking, if, this was, if the first event was to happen in a few weeks, when would they have to submit an application for review? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, in order for the use to not have to cease, presuming that, they would need to submit I would be suggesting uh, three months in. But for that, I will uh, foreshadow an amendment and I won't commit to a time frame now, but somewhere between 12 and 24 months, but with a review of the venue management plan uh, following six months. So I'll advise that over the next couple of days. Um, just a question in relation to proposed condition 2.4, uh, particularly conferences, meetings, and community events. There's no talk of uh, hour, or that the hours are discussed, no talk of limitation of numbers. Uh, at all? Is that something that is contemplated? Is that governed by building occupancy certificates or otherwise? Or is it possible for there to be 200 people attending a seven-day conference uh, that's not actually an event that's as, as listed? So just a, a question is, I understand the intent, but just in, if we are going to apply the condition, do we need to limit those numbers or is it limited by building occupancy? And if the building itself has an occupancy limit based on the square meterage, what is that number? Through you, Mayor Cole, um, it would be limited by uh, building occupancy anyway. Um, so I would suggest that in the absence of the applicant having landed on a figure of how many people would be at such uh, uh, sessions such as uh, educational um, related or master classes and such, it's difficult to limit them um, because we do support that uh, occurring during the day. As long as it is between 7am to 7pm, um, we would leave the occupancy up to uh, building requirements. Do, do we know what the building occupancy capacity is? Through you, Cole, uh, as I advised previously, it's 100. That's what we've been told. OK, thank you. Nothing further. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, I'll... I appreciate this has just come in, so, but I, I probably on the basis of that information, I, I think that we need to make sure that um, of foreshadow a possible amendment to condition 2.4 in relation to patron numbers. I, I think that if we're restricting musical events on a Saturday between 2 and 5 to a limit of people, um, I think it, it would be 
anyway, I think that there's, there's potentially this inconsistency there. Um, I'll also foreshadow an amendment in relation to the hours of operation on a Saturday. I think we should just save it from 2 till 10 rather than listing two show times because if the operator chooses to have a show between, should it be approved, between, you know, 5 and 8 and only doing one show on that day, then I, I, I don't feel that we that, you know, so I'll just foreshadow that. And my question is just relates to the management plan and the, um, in relation to no serving of food and beverages to patrons on site and whether that was requested um, and um, any reason for that um, not occurring. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that was... Uh advised by the applicant as part of that proposal, that they wouldn't be serving or their int intention wasn't to serve food and beverages. Um, in terms of servicing or servicing the patrons and, and provision of food and beverages, um, there's health requirements as part of that that would need to be uh, achieved. Now, we haven't contemplated that on the basis that they just did not propose that. Um, if the, um, say, that was the a management plan was silent in relation to a prohibition on serving food and pe beverages on the site. Would that um, have any impact on the any approvals that would be required from a health perspective should the applicant seek to serve food and beverages to pa patrons on site? Through you, Cole, no, it wouldn't. You would still need to seek all of those relevant approvals. Um, I would want to better understand how that would work, um, given the context that uh, it's been uh, proposed to have, uh, ultimately you enter the venue via a driveway, walk straight through to the, the venue where you sat down to your seat and watch the performance, then you leave. So I'm not sure where that mingling and eating of food would occur in this situation and bearing in mind noise, I'm not sure how that would stack up against the, the noise requirements as well. That would be my only comment. Councillor Castle. Through you, Mayor Cole. Sorry, I have a couple of extra questions. Um, in relation to 2.2, uh, it talks about f maximum of four sessions to run in those time slots. I'm assuming the intention for each of these events is for them to take place over the course of that weekend, so consecutive days, and I'm just wondering if it's necessary to make that clear in the conditions, um, or whether, as it currently reads, an event could actually happen over several weekends, um, and, and if so, what impact that would have on the amenity. Um, and also, I'm perhaps foreshadowing an amendment, but just wondering if you gave any consideration to the limit of people um, being spread across those sessions as opposed to concentrated into each event, if that makes sense. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, take your first point and accept that um, in terms of being uh, clearer about uh, being consecutive um, I guess sessions in that one weekend that forming an event so we can fix that through the briefing notes um, in terms of uh, the number of patrons uh, in total over a weekend uh, that wasn't contemplated um, I would want to better understand what that would mean overall I guess my question would be one would, could you contemplate um, a condition that said for each event, being those four sessions, one session would, or two sessions would have 100 persons, one would have 60, one would have 80, so that that combined impact on the weekend was um, perhaps reduced as opposed to having one event that could have 400 people come through in a weekend and another that has... 240. Um, whether whether one of those is preferable, whether that's harder to condition, just I guess raising that as a possibility and whether that could be con contemplated. Through you, Mayor Cole, yeah, it's, it presents a challenge because we want to still provide the applicant with flexibility. I don't know um, if there may be a particular event where it may attract um, 
I guess, more interest um, from the club members and uh, I could understand why there would be more attendees potentially. So you don't want to limit them too much. So uh, as long as it achieves that, um, the, the reduction of the scale, uh, I think there's a number of ways you could do it, but I think it just needs to be viable for the applicant as well. Councillor Toppelberg. Thank you. Um, given that it's an unlisted use, in the event that this was approved, would a, any minor variation be able to be approved under delegated authority? So as an example, the Jade and I do orchestra is appearing for one day only on a Thursday and wants to put a 60 person gig on that evening uh, and it's known two weeks before and they put in an application, would it need to wait for a council meeting cycle or is that something that could be approved under delegated authority if the use is approved? Sorry, I should note that Jane Idu Orchestra may attract 100 people. <laughs> <laughs> Through you, Meghol, uh, in terms of the planning framework, um, there is uh, exemptions under our planning regulations uh, for a temporary use. Uh, that is a use that occurs for less than 48 hours within a year period, so that is possible that they would be exempt from that. So... Asked another way, events, if this approval was to stand, let's say, for a period of two years, would there be the ability for... Uh, well, I can hear there's a change potentially in response, so I'll wait for, you, I'll wait for that one. But, uh, yeah, does, if... I guess I'm, what I'm asking is if there are other possibilities contemplated, do they need to be dealt with as part of the original DA or are we potentially going to be back here every third or fourth month for a special event or missing out on an opportunity or the applicant missing an opportunity because of the council process? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, in terms of the delegations, uh, where the item has been presented to council previously, it would need to come back through council for an amendment. Is there a way that, that, that without delegating it, that the contemplation of variations uh, maybe for you know, I don't know, X nights per year or, or, or otherwise could be conditioned as part of the approval? I don't, is that something that could be conditioned so that in that event that something, a particular opportunity arises, you don't either need a special council meeting or to forego that opportunity if the, if the use is approved? Through you, Mayor Cole, you could craft a condition to allow um, that flexibility um, for a certain number of events or sessions to occur that may be outside of these approved timeframes, um, and, and that could form part of the approval. Can I ask that that please be considered, and I'll liaise with you on the, the number that I think may be appropriate, but that would be great. So no, a number per year. Thanks. Councillor Hallett. I guess as a follow-up to that, um, the conditions about once a month uh, events, um, just wondering if uh, Councillor Toppelberg's uh, suggestion would cover, for example, having uh, an event at the beginning of the month and a beginning at the end of the month, um, given that there may not be all that much flexibility in visiting um, artists and things. Um, could that flexibility be built in? Through you, Mayor Cole, just to clarify, you're suggesting that um, to allow events not one per calendar month, but to allow six ev uh, events potentially just within that six-month period? Pretty much, yeah. I guess the, the choice of a calendar month versus every four weeks or, or something, I think it just it does provide some limits to flexibility around um, scheduling while still maintaining space or um, less amenity impact. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, that is possible. Uh, it just comes down to how we want to construct that condition wording um, because ultimately you still want to maintain some separation between events so it just doesn't uh, become a recurrence every weekend, um, but allowing that flexibility. So happy to consider that as part of the briefing notes if we can discuss offline. Councillors, um, just a couple of questions from me. Just um, because the land use issue is is being considered. In relation to the objections and support, would Council be able to get some information about uh, the 20% that objected within the 100 metres if, for Council members' information, the locations of the objectives, uh, objectors rather, and also in relation to the um, petition that's been brought forward, there does seem to be a number of Baker um, Avenue 
residents on that list. So I think that whilst the report does state that um, it's noted but hasn't been included in the table as it was not received directly from property owners, I think it is valuable information. It would be useful to know um, the, uh, um, any of the petitioners that are immediate neighbours or that live on Baker Avenue, if that information could be provided separately. I think that would be useful. Um, in relation to the noise, my understanding is that it's just the coming and going of um, the, the attendees or patrons and once inside, if you could confirm that the venue is fully soundproofed. So would there be any noise from patrons talking, music, etc., once they're in the um, enclosed studio? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, know that it's not an issue with noise once you're inside the venue. Um, the noise nuisance um, would be uh, the patrons coming and leaving the premises. Yep, okay. And just in relation to some of the practicalities of the venue management um, conditions under 3.1, it talks about no use of um, Aston Lane for deliveries, loading or unloading of equipment. Um, I have visited the studio. I'm trying to think of the practicalities of bringing in everything through the front. Is there any reason why it would be a problem to have some um, pick up and set down happening within the, the right of way? Is it the, the width of the right of way or, yeah? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, it's probably more so um, obstruction of the right of way um, and that uh, by entering via um, the street front, uh, you're able to unload down that, that driveway. So it presents a challenge because it can take some time to unload and load equipment. Um, so that would present an obstruction in the laneway, which isn't permitted. Um, is it possible to find out the width of the laneway in the briefing notes? Yep, thank you. Um, and just in relation to identifying drop-off and pick-up locations for taxis with no drop-off and pick-up to be from Baker Avenue, just again, the, do you think that's a practical solution? And if it's not in Baker Avenue, where would um, the city see that pick-up and drop-off happening? To you, Mayor Cole, um, the issue raised, or one of a number of issues raised during community consultation was uh, traffic that this uh, use could generate. Uh, when you have potentially 100 patrons attending the site at any one time, that could present an issue on a local road um, with a cul-de-sac that terminates. So uh, on that basis, uh, even through the applicant's um, car parking um, consideration, it was suggested that you know, it would be uh, more appropriate for people to park or um, be dropped off not directly at the venue front. Uh, that's really the purpose of saying, you know, uh, don't have the taxis and such dropping patrons directly at the door front. Um, that would present some traffic issues. Thank you. Councillor Toppelberg. Just to confirm, uh, the performances are proposed to be three hours and the car parking limits on the entire Baker Avenue stretch are two hours, is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, that's correct. So given the nature of the proposed invitation of uh, the ability to attend the performance and the direct correspondence either by members or by the attendees will have, is it not likely that they'll be aware that bringing a vehicle is not for drop-off is different, but parking a vehicle won't be an option because the performance will outlast the length of time that they're able to legally stay in the street? Through Mercole, yes, that would um, uh, be made known to the, uh, the members um, when, in terms of the terms of signing up, um, just that information being provided and suggestion to park elsewhere, um, specifically Brisbane Street park, car park. Councillors, any further questions? Okay, thank you very much. That was a thorough Q&A for a late item. So pretty well done you know, <laughs> in getting those questions out, council members. Um, if you have any further questions during the week, please um, put them through. Um, the next item that was raised was item 5.3, which is 2 Brookman Street, Perth, change of use from single house to unlisted use, bracket short-term dwelling and single house. Questions on this application? Councillor Toppelberg. 
Uh, just to confirm, the city's view summarised in relation to the heritage concerns, which are, were brought up by some of the uh, objectors, uh, the, the city's view and certainly the view of the SAT determination that was handed down uh, last week is that because there are no alterations to the built form proposed that Heritage has no planning consideration at all in this matter, is that correct? Through Mayor Cole, in a summary, yes, that's right. And that the SAT determination in relation to 8 Moyer Street uh, effectively uh, rejected all of the reasons for refusal other than the established solely residential character of the surrounding uh, of, of the property and, and obviously noting that it's uh, sitting with residential neighbours on all sides and opposite, uh, which is, in the officer's opinion, markedly different to number two, Brooklyn Street. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, it was ultimately about the context. Um, that was a key principle and consideration in the, in the uh, SAT determination that you're referring to. Um, context in terms of what is or who is immediately adjoining uh, and the potential impacts um, on those properties. So, yes, context was the key consideration. Okay, and the um, if the applicant was at a later stage to seek to remove the six months within a 12 month period provision, that would be considered a variation to this application, not a fresh application. So this is an application for it to be short-term accommodation and one of the conditions that is it is not for it to be short-term accommodation for six months. It is actually an application for the property to be approved for use as short-term accommodation and one of the planning conditions that exists is the limitation of the six months. Is that correct? Through you, Mayor Cole, and after a period of 24 months, the uh, approval will cease. Correct. I, I ask that only because is, it is open to the applicant if the approval is granted, the use exists, and they can then potentially challenge that condition if they desire. So uh, is that adequately covered in the advice notes or otherwise about the... Uh, uh, if that is a con key consideration of council as the decision maker or the officers, is, there, is that able to be couched in some way in the advice notes or otherwise that there is, if there is a difference between its approval a short-term accommodation or its use of short-term accommodation for six out of the 12 months. Is that able to be captured in some way in the decision to give it any extra weight or is it just sits as a planning condition and it's then up to potentially a third party to make that determination if that was to be an avenue that was pursued by this owner or another owner of the property? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, ultimately uh, it forms the terms of the approval and any of the conditions or the decision itself um, could be appealed to SAT. So uh, in any decision, I guess the applicant has that, um, has that right. Uh, is there an advice note that we could include that alludes to what you're referring to? Potentially, uh, but I'm not sure if that would, uh, or it doesn't, change the ability for the applicant to, to pursue that further. Uh, in saying that, any, just playing that out, any SAT review process would have regard for the merits of this particular proposal and the merits of this proposal, an important one is that it is intended to be used for um, a portion of the year as opposed to a full-time um, short-term accommodation. Council members, Council Gondoszewski. Forgive me if I've missed this, but just um, is there um, any information as to how um, officers would seek to determine compliance with the condition around the duration of use as short-term accommodation or the, the, the six months? How would, if a complaint was received, how would um, that be verified? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, it's a great question. Um, in terms of the principles, um, I guess that's... Uh, it's, there's an ability to approve this. Compliance is always the challenge, I find, with um, short-term accommodation uh, and unlisted uses. Uh, in saying that, uh, it could be a uh, form part of this approval in terms of the approval that needs to be confirmed in advance um, when it will be uh, operating in, in that manner. 
aside from any confirmation from the applicant, it would be difficult to calculate over the course uh, of a year uh, how long the use has been operating. Um, I don't know if there's been any discussion with the applicant in relation to the booking platform that they would be using, but I'd be grateful for any um, investigation that could be undertaken in relation to how, um, I guess, third-party data or booking platform data could be sourced or if it is able to be provided in relation to assessment of compliance with conditions. Um, I don't know if this is occurring in other jurisdictions in Australia that are also grappling with this short-term accommodation issue. Through you, Mayor Cole, we can investigate and provide in briefing notes. Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Through you, I just noted um, just uh, to um, to the officer, the ma um, management plan um, just refers to um, uh, the a three a minimum three nights stay, um, and just queried why that. Um, we've just got a, um, a reference back to the min uh, management plan, but it hasn't been referenced as a specific condition. And also, the management plan did actually refer to um, the operation uh, for being expected to be less than three months of the year in, um, in total and why um, uh, six months has been nominated when the uh, applicant's management plan um, clearly refers to, to three months. Through you, Mayor Cole, um, there is not an explicit or standalone uh, condition mandating a minimum of three nights stay uh, because that's uh, captured in the management plan, which forms uh, condition number 1.2, so they're bound by operating in accordance with the terms of that management plan. Uh, in terms of the three to six month period, it's actually initially proposed to operate f uh, between three and six months. Through the community consultation period, there were concerns raised with the use, um, the nature of the use, and in response, the applicant um, uh, reduced uh, the term that this premises would be used as a uh, short-term accommodation. Now, on balance, uh, city's officers are satisfied that the management plan, the context, um, would enable uh, a six-month use uh, for a short-term accommodation, and it would be appropriate in this on this site. So, on that basis, uh, administrations recommended that six months or up to six months um, would be appropriate. Councillor Kondrashevsky, sorry, one more, just in relation to parking. Just let me get my head around this. Um, would it be possible to get some advice in relation to other temporary accommodation approvals, um, and if? Um, Right. I, I probably, I think you can probably just get you to confirm this for me. Where we have approved temporary accommodation, say bed and breakfasts, etc., um, in residential areas, um, I presume and would be grateful for confirmation that residential parking permits have not been made available to the guests of those businesses. Um, and I guess what the um, uh, whether there has been any circumstances where we have um, al allowed for the, say, owner-operator of those premises to um, utilise all available on-site parking or whether we've required additional parking to be provided. I'm just thinking, I think of one on Money Street or Munga Street or something where we, um, a, an additional bay was required to be installed or something. Um, so I, I, I have some queries in relation to the use of um, parking permits um, and whether there's, uh, that's ever been allowed in other temporary accommodation approvals. Through you, Mayor Cole. Um, yes, we can investigate and provide um, through the briefing notes. Uh, this did come up during the assessment or the course of the assessment and was discussed with, uh, with the applicant in that there's a slight difference being for those other short-term accommodation um, assuming that that is intended to be used for that sole purpose. This is um, for up to half of a year and therefore for the remainder of that year it will be used as a single house. We discuss this further internally with the relevant department and they confirm that um, on that basis they, the occupants, the landowner, still has the rights to the residential parking permits and they have, uh, they have access to that. So 
on that basis, slightly different, uh, sli slightly different, but happy to investigate other examples um, of those short-term accommodations. I'd, without um, putting forth my views on the application as a whole, I would probably um, consider putting forth an, um, an amendment in relation to the use of um, the residential parking purposes during the time when the premises is being used as a short-term accommodation facility, recognising that obviously the resident has the right to be issued with those permits and utilise them during the time when the, um, the premises is, being, um, uh, is, is forming uh, as a residential dwelling. Councillor Fatakis. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, it's just back to um, parking um, as well. Can you confirm how many um, residential parking permits have actually currently issued uh, to this property? And I just want to refer again through to the management plan um, and also to the code, um, uh, code of conduct uh, document where they refer to um, parking on Brookman Street. Um, and I know that there was reference through in the briefing notes back to clarifying that um, the, the city's par uh, policy with regards to permits, but in my reading of that, um, implying that those permits are specifically for parking on any individual street um, isn't consistent with the city's own policy. Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, first part of your question was how many park residential parking permits. They have one residential parking permit. Um, in terms of your the second part of your question, sorry, could you please clarify or repeat? Yeah, through you, Mayor. Sorry, Jay. Um, just uh, um, let me get back to... I just in the management plan and the code of conduct, um, they refer to the parking permit providing uh, and parking on um, on Brookman Street, um, but our own policy itself um, clearly says that um, those permits uh, are not for any specific um, specific bays or any specific street. So I th um, what I'm looking at is some clarity in terms of the information that's provided through to uh, potential residents. Thanks for clarifying through you, Mayor Cole. I'll uh, take that on notice and better understand the policy and provide it in the briefing note. Councillors. Um, manager, just a couple of questions from me, although, sorry, one of them has been asked. Um, I'm just really wanting some clarification whether the applicant sought three to six months, three months or six months when they put their original application in. Through you, Mayor Cole, I will check the exact wording and confirm that in the briefing notes. Thank you. And also, um, just to reflect on a SAT case that the City um, won or, um, or was, sorry, rather, upheld, um, was the dental proposed dental surgery on Glebe Street. Might just be worth revisiting that because that was opposite Coles North Perth Plaza. So it was a residential street on one side com with the other side being wholly commercial. So I'm just wondering whether it might be worthwhile going back to that SAT decision that um, that the city um, the city's or the council's decision was upheld on that matter um, and just generally maybe a question for the um, acting director um, the recent sat decision on sorry did, what did what number did we say it was four eight Moyer Street does talk about the fact that um, as we're aware that we that the current policy does not include any direction or guidance as to where temporary accommodation may be appropriately located or what criteria will be applied in the assessment of such applications and so on. Um, could we have an update on how the development of policy is going and um, when there'll be an opportunity to discuss the objectives of that policy with the Council? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, so the administration has completed a review of the existing um, short-term accommodation policy prior to receiving this um, SAT decision and the SAT decision has confirmed um, what our review found. Um, 
We have also been um, keeping track of the parliamentary inquiry into these types of accommodations, um, which was released, I think, on the 26th of September. So um, that parliamentary inquiry provides a number of recommendations that the state government should provide direction um, or various different elements for local governments to then follow. Um, so we're just in the process now of reviewing um, the specific details of the parliamentary inquiry um, and then we'll be able to put a report up to our executive and then a council workshop recommending an approach going forward and when is the um, most appropriate time to make various different changes to our overall planning framework in relation to short-term accommodation um, because it is although the corporate business plan or the, the project this year is focused on um, reviewing the policy there's all the SAT decision has also identified um, a number of related issues with um, the scheme and the land use definitions so um, we'll put that together in a package and um, provide that shortly to council members via the council workshop process. Yes, thank you. That was my next question about inclusion of a use in the scheme and whether that could be um, dealt with simultaneously. Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, we can provide advice on the various different options that the city has available um, to manage short-term accommodation when we provide that up to the council workshop. Thank you very much. Are there any further questions, councillors? Um, also, I just wanted to add, I think this would be useful to um, undertake a site visit on this matter. So um, I'll arrange with yourself, manager, and um, invite council members along. And we could also see if the applicant might wish to um, be present as well. Probably be looking at Monday if possible. So just to flag that and I'll send an email out to council members. Okay. Um, thank you. Next item raised is 5.4 which is number 396 to 398 Fitzgerald Street, North Perth, proposed change of use from office to unlisted use Cat Hotel. Councillor Loden. Um, just on the question of waste management, um, the, propose, the proposal for waste management is to uh, take a whole heap of the organic matter, wrap it in plastic and then throw it in the bin. I recognise this complies with health regs and all that sort of stuff. But are there um, any alternative methods that this can that can be used that would enable this to go into something like Fogo? Obviously, wrapping it in plastic before it goes into Fogo is not going to work. But if there's other um, methods of storage or something like that, because a significant amount of the waste coming out of this site will be organic in nature, um, and it'd be good if that could be um, composted or otherwise once Fogo is introduced. To you, Michael. I'll take that question if that's okay. We'll um, I'll put some more information in the briefing notes. We'll do some research see if there are composting options available on the market and if that's commonly used. Councillors, any questions? No. Okay. Moving on then to item five point six, which is two thousand and nineteen twenty. Um, community Sporting and Recreation Facilities Fund Small Grants Application Woodville Reserve Master Plan. Any questions on this item? Quite straightforward. Okay, item 5.7, Optus Stadium Submission on Proposed Regulation 19B Venue Approval. Any questions on this item? Um, I did have a question. Um, I just wanted to ask a question in relation to um, sound monitoring. Our response is actually asking the town of Victoria Park to go further and to um, seek sound, um, sound monitoring of sound checks and rehearsals. I just wondered whether, you know, if it was a sound check that lasted for 10 minutes, whether that might be a little bit... Um, who am I asking this question of? John Corbellini, Stephanie. Um, yes, uh, thank you for listening. The person who is receiving the question is listening. That is the main thing. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so the question is, is that perhaps, you know, if a sound check is something that's very brief, etc., are we asking for something that's creating a whole other level of requirement that might be a little bit OTT? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, my understanding of the sound checks is that um, they are much more extensive than, than a simple 10-minute um, exercise, and it's something that the city requires uh, when we are the... De- um, decision-making authority on uh, no- these types of noise regulation um, requests. So for um, HBF Park and other events that the city holds, we um, undertake sound um, noise level monitoring for um, our events, and uh, including the, the rehearsals. So um, we felt that it was appropriate to request that from the town of Victoria Park given that um, the scale of some of the events would be such that they're likely to have quite a lengthy sound check process before the event commences. That sounds perfectly reasonable and just in relation to notifying occupiers receiving in excess of 60 decibels is that going to add a whole nother layer of Uh, In terms of the extensiveness of adding that um, request, do we have an idea of whether that would be a much greater radius? I'm just trying to get a feel for the extent that that would further extent of of, um, notification that may or may not be required. Uh, Through you, Mayor Cole, I believe that it includes the area um, just within uh, what's shown on attachment five. Um, So it's in the south-eastern portion of the city, um, basically up to sort of Lord Street would be the the boundary. Um, So we would be requesting that, uh, or what we're suggesting we request from um, the town of Victoria Park is that before the events are held, they will be responsible for notifying um, all of the people, both within the town of Victoria Park and the uh, city of Vincent, that they the events will be occurring um, in this in the similar way to what the city would do for HBF Park or other venues that we have um, in just notifying them that the events are happening. And is this, is this the same level of notification that we give based on the same decibels for um, for Perth Oval, whatever uh, it's called now, HBF Park? Yeah, uh, I believe so, but I will check and confirm in the briefing notes. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Um, no items from infrastructure and environment this round. Too busy doing the doing. <coughs> um, 7.1, <laughs> late report, WA Treasury Corporation Local Government Master Lending Agreement. Are there any questions? No. I think we've got to get you some blue tack, Councillor Gondoshevsky. Mm-hmm. Uh, 7.2, licence to Pride WA, use of portion of lot 15, number 4, View Street, North Perth, 16th of October to the 2nd of December 2019. Any questions? No. 7.3, investment report as, 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 sorry, as at 31st of August 2019. Any questions? authorisation of expenditure for the period 1st of September to 23rd of September 2019. Councillor Gondoshevsky. I can't recall exactly what page the entry's on, but I just was grateful for some information in relation to the um, Halloween event that is being uh, hosted by the City at North Perth Town Hall. Um, My question is... um, whether this event is being put on by the city and North Perth local as part of their funding under our arts and events funding package, um, or whether it is a city funded event, and if so, um, what the, I guess, budget line item is that relates to that. Um, And then also just in relation to that event, um, the um, number of, attendees that could be hosted over the course of that evening. I understand it's a um, free but ticketed event or it's a ticketed event and just to um, get an assessment of how many people could go through the site over the course of the evening. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, um, my understanding is that this is a city funded event and it's funded through our events, um, our general activation and events budget, which um, 
the marketing and comms team have allocated each year, and they do various activation events such as this throughout the city. Um, and in relation to the number of attendees, I'll need to take that on notice um, and get an understanding of where the or what the capacity of the site is, plus where we are with ticket sales and, and maximum tickets that we're offering. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess at this stage I, I wouldn't necessarily expect there to be um, clear numbers on the per, like the people that have requested tickets. I'm more interested in what the maximum capacity would be, should it be an event that's fully subscribed. And also, um, while you're preparing things for the briefing notes, I'd be grateful if you could just confirm what percentage of the um, marketing team's arts and act, you know, events and activations budget this event um, is... Uh, comprising, um, and I guess um, just so that I don't have to do the maths, what the overall budget is for this year and how we're tracking. Thanks. Councillors, any questions? Okay. Oh, sorry, Councillor Toppelberg. Sorry, just one. Um, the consultancy fee for the integrated transport plan, uh, what's, I'm not sure who I'm asking this of, perhaps it's uh, the Director of Infrastructure and Environment, perhaps. Not anyway, maybe on notice, but uh, it's still. Oh, Steph. Okay. Um, what's the total value of the contract? Do we know the, that? Through UMACO, the total value of the contract is two hundred eighty thousand dollars. Of which two two hundred three thousand five hundred has been just been paid. Does that mean? And just it's only triggered my interest <coughs> as to where we are in yeah. the cycle. Uh, so considering that the chunk of the payment is being been paid, when can we expect to see uh, some reporting back to Council? Uh, through you, Mayor Cole, so the portions of the contract which have been satisfied um, is the is part one. Um, that included a lot of significant portion of data collection um, relating to parking. So um, that information has now been provided um, and I would expect before the end of the year we would have a draft um, proposal that we could bring before council uh, in a workshop setting. Yes, noted. Does, yeah. <laughs> it's a question only situation. Um, does anyone have any further questions? Okay, thank you. Moving on then to financial statements, seven, sorry, 7.5, financial statements as at 31st of August 2019. Any questions? Um, Director of Community and Business, I did have a question. The report says that um, just over half of rates have received, been received. Page 482 talks about 19 point roughly 4 million with 18.5 million outstanding. And I just wanted to ask whether um, this is um, similar to previous years or whether uh, more um, residents and ratepayers are using the instalment payments and how that sort of tracks um, against more recent previous years because it's, I guess, just over 50% has been received. Yes, through you, Mayor Cole, there is a graph, I wish I could find it, um, in the document that shows... Uh, what was estimated to this point in the year versus what we've received. It is just slightly below, um, so a few percent below what we would expect. So it's on target. Um, I haven't done, and we haven't done an uh, assessment of um, instalments versus um, outright, but, but given that graph, I think everything is on track. So which page is the graph on? I'm trying to find it, sorry. Uh, so if you have, oh, I think it's, it's right in the middle of the document. Uh, page 63, I think. Sorry, I've got the HTML version open, so. I'm operating by page numbers in the four and five hundreds here. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I think it's page 63 of the attachment. Mm, that's not the way Docs on Tap is working for, for me anymore. 545. 545, thank you. Okay. It's the, the bar graph with the blue and then the red lines, if that helps. Note 7. 
Note 7 rating information. Okay, I'll study that and ask any follow-up questions I may or may not have. Thank you. Any further questions on the financial statements? Thanks. Moving on to Chief Executive Officer Reports, 8.1, rev revocation of power of attorney and granting of new power of attorney to subdivide and sell land within the Tamala Park Regional Council. Questions? <coughs> Nope, straightforward. 8.2, dedication of lots 889 and 890 as road, corner Fitzgerald and Bulwer Streets, Perth and write-off of outstanding rates debt. Any questions? Councillor Loden. Thank you, Mayor. It may be yet again my old man eyes playing up, but um, could you just clarify, these pieces of land, are they footpath or road? Or what, what is it that's actually over these pieces of land? Through you, Mayor Cole, uh, lot 890, which is on the Baller Street side, that's primarily footpath, and then lot 889, which is on the Fitzgerald Street side, that covers their crossover and then also a bit of footpath. Is that satisfied your question, Councillor? Any further questions? No, okay. 8.3 grant of section 91 license to the city of Vincent, Summer Street, Car Park and Access Road. Councillor Gondoshevsky. Um, I'll beg your forgiveness to ask about adjacent land to this um, application. Just in relation to the report where it talks about the um, tenure for the land. Um, <coughs> So from the report, I understand that essentially um, it says that tenure cannot be granted in relation to the land due to the ongoing Southwest Native Title Settlement. Um, and just to confirm that um, uh, that the land between what we're talking about and the river, like the uh, foreshore, I guess, where the, the trees are, etc., would also be... Um, covered by the same restriction at this point in time where there's not going to be any um, assessment as to um, granting of tenure? Is that, would that be correct? Through you, Mayor Cole. Yes, the land, if you look on page um, 571 of the agenda, so everything in pink, which includes the Forsha area with the trees along um, the river, that's all unallocated Crown land. So tenure can, uh, a management order can't be granted until the native title claim is settled. So does that mean in terms of the other facilities aside from the car park that are um, currently located on that unallocated Crown land um, that the city would have to seek a licence to undertake any maintenance works of, say, the cycle path, lighting, um, fencing, seating, etc. that is um, on that land? Through you, Mayor Cole. Under the Local Government Act, uh, unvested facilities, which can include bike paths, they're the responsibility of the local government to maintain. In this instance, Department of Lands have told us that they don't recognise the car park and access road as an unvested facility, which is why we need to uh, receive a licence in order to undertake the works. And also, just in relation to the um, section around low impact future acts of the Native Title Act, um, and where it talks about that um, the um, on page 56 number it says that excluding uh, public health or safety so that sub that um, it doesn't apply to uh, foreshore reclamation regeneration environmental assessment or protection activities um, is I guess I'm trying to assess it in relation to if should the city need to take undertake works in relation to um, the maintenance of that section of foreshore on that unallocated Crown land, what approvals would the city, if any, need to obtain um, in order to, to undertake those works? Through you, Michael, I'll check that. I'm pretty sure once we have this licence, that's the only approval. We don't require um, the section, section 18 notice that we're requiring for Banks Reserve for the works there because it's not a recognised Aboriginal site at the moment. Uh, but I'll just clarify and we'll provide that information. Thank you. I guess f just so that you can clarify, I'm specifically asking in relation to any activities that may be required to support the uh, riverbank from further erosion such as 
I don't know, walls, etc. you know. Through you, Mayor Cole, can I just clarify that this licence only relates to the car park access way and the car park area? Yes, I'm yeah. completely aware that the licence only relates to the car park, which is why at the beginning I said I'm going to beg your forgiveness for asking about something else that I'm trying to get answers to at the moment. No further questions, okay. Um, is it, I note in the report that we have to pay a licence fee it's only $500, but is it absolutely necessary? I know it talks about for it to cover administrative costs, but it does seem... Well, is it, is it absolutely necessary? Through you, Mayor Cole, when Department of Lands put the proposed terms to us, they said a $500 fee was necessary to cover like the negotiation, drafting the licence and those administrative costs. So, yes, they've said it's necessary. That's like their condition of granting us the licence. Thanks, State Government. Any further questions on this item? Okay. Last item for the evening is 8.4, the Information Bulletin. Any questions? Not tonight. Okay. Um, before we conclude the meeting, I'd just like to say happy birthday, Councillor Murphy. What better way to spend your birthday <laughs> than at a council briefing? Um, <laughs> So I will declare the meeting close at 8.16pm. Thank you.